Hey guys, welcome to Legally Black. Thank you for tuning in again. Um, I'm in my car because right now I'm actually on my third day of orientation at Howard. Um, it's a great experience. I've never been around so many intelligent black professionals before. Um, it's inspiring. Most of the institutions that I've been in have been predominantly white. So it's a great uh, change of scenery. I just wanted to come up here real quick to discuss getting into Howard Law School and how that process went for me. So um first of course um you need to take the lsat that and your gpa for your undergraduate degree um is important so i was still in school while i while i was uh studying and taking the lsats so i was still in school while taking and studying for the lsats um the material that i used was all power score I got their self-study package, which included a legal, logical reasoning, like textbook, um, and then they have a workbook and then a practice book. So it's three. And then uh, they have the logic games, textbook, workbook, practice book, and then reading comprehension. They have the same set of three. I also did the online classes that took place every Saturday in the morning time well it was around like from 12 to 3 and so what i would do is i would do the self-studying by myself they have like a, a pamphlet to help you um pace yourself and where you should be and whatnot so i did that and then after doing a section i would my the class that i was taking online through power score they went by um those textbooks and went by those chapters. So I would take a chapter and then I would go to class that Saturday and it would help me out tremendously because something that I did not understand by myself or I just was not getting in, it was not resonating with me, the instructor would word it or teach it a different way or a different manner. And so that helped out a lot. And then um, he would show us different techniques as well. I also got the power score flashcards, uh, but they were just for logical reasoning. I thought that it would help me out, but when I got them, it COVID had really hit and everything started shutting down. So the point of me getting them was to like use the flashcards while I'm waiting in the waiting room or something like that, but that wasn't the case. So I didn't really use them or need them. So I studied for the LSAS no more than five months. I wanted to give myself more time than that, but I didn't realize how rigorous the LSAS was. I'm gonna be honest with you, I didn't. Um, but I knew what cycle I was trying to apply to schools for. So I was like, and I wasn't trying to take it again. So I'm like, this is just gonna have to be what it's gonna be. And I'm gonna leave it in God's hands. Um, so I, that's what I did. I did that, I used the power score, everything. So I got my LSAT scores back and it was not what I wanted at all. I wanted to break the 160s. I broke the 160s doing my practice test, um, but instead I got a 158. So that was a bit discouraging to me. Um, what I did realize though, right? So I was walking through my apartment building cause I just finished moving and I seen a few uh, guys studying for the LSATs. I, I recognized the book and I started talking to them and they asked me my LSAT score and I was like, oh, you know, I got a 50, 150 AM and I'm really proud of that. And one of them was like, that's my goal. And then I realized I have to be thankful for at least that, especially since I was only studying for about four or five months. But that's what I wanted. The median for Howard at the time that I was looking at, I, I want to say that it was like, it was in the 150s. The, the median, the average was in the 150s. Um, and I also like stalked the law numbers pay, uh, website. So if you go on there to show you people's LSAT scores, their uh, GPA, and when they applied to the school, if they got a scholarship, and if they got accepted, waitlisted, or otherwise. And that helped me out a lot as well. So I did that. So I got my 158, and my GPA was a 4.0 at the time that I applied, right? So after I applied and I got in, I was just kind of like, not just throw school by the wayside, but Um, not just throw it by the wayside, but I um, wasn't too strict or too hard on myself af afterwards, which was stupid because you have to send them your official transcript after you graduate. So, um, so I ended up, ended up graduating with a three point eight, yeah, th a three point eight, and and my degree was in legal studies, if that helps. So, 
I have my GPA um, at the time, 4.0, but 3.8 um, with the 158 with the 158 LSAT score so I wasn't too happy about that but um I went ahead and, and uh applied so I wanted to apply as soon as they opened up for review um you have to sign up for L LSAC they send your they're the people who send your report to the school so you can't just send your stuff to the school straight out you have to go through LSAC um, so you create your profile you pay for the packages um, and they send everything off so in LSAC you have the option to add the schools that you're looking to apply to right and when you add them their their um, profile will give you the date that they start accepting applications right so i can't recall the exact month that howard started opening applications but you should do your due diligence if you want to go to howard or any other school and find out when they start when they begin to review applications or when they open up for um being able to submit your applications because um, some schools they will open for you to submit but they're not going to review it for another month or so so i want i want to do that so while I was taking the LSATs and while I was getting ready for that, I was also getting my um, other components ready. Your personal statement, diversity statement. I'm no, I know that's optional for some schools. Um, what else? And my resume. So those components. My personal statement, I wrote about pretty much why I wanted to be a lawyer, why Howard, um, and a my journey thus far and it was no more than two pages for me which was hard I, w I, I asked a lot of lawyers some of my teachers to review um my personal statement at first I, I ain't gonna lie to y'all it was about five pages by the time I was done with them it was two pages um which is good because ain't nobody about to read five pages about your life they don't care they don't care that much so I um did that um some things that I feel like made my personal statement may have stood out. Um, I talked about my trauma in my childhood and how that affected me and uh, wanted to go to law school. A quick, a quick synopsis. So when I was younger, I have another video on this, but when I was younger, I was sexually abused. And being sexually abused so young by multiple people, um, I think that it and been physically abused mostly mentally and spiritually all that by my mother it traumatized me so much that i became a mute essentially so i went to a deaf school fun fact about me i went to a deaf school as a child because i just would not talk um i just wouldn't talk and in that growing up i just found like I didn't like to talk unless I had something uh, significant or important to say. I'm not, and I'm still not. I'm still not one of those people who just like talk to hear myself talk. I'm definitely silent unless I feel like um, I need to say something. So that, in that, it just created this love of words and word word play and the port and the importance of that. Um, that's why I do spoken word. I do poetry. So I talked about that in my. Uh, personal statement and it was essentially about a journey uh, for the underdog so growing up and being told I wasn't going to uh, be anything or being put down a lot and working through uh, that that trauma going through boot camp going into the military getting into a field that I had no I'm just not tech savvy wasn't very confident in doing that stuff and then I did it and I succeeded and then now my next step is to go to law school that that's my goal so that's a synopsis of my personal statement um I also because I applied to almost just a bunch of schools um and I did that because I like options um always have a plan b c um 
so i i did that and so um for my personal statements what i would do it at the end i would leave a clause to add something about the specific school that i was applying to like and this is why i choose to go to such and such because you all have a program for da -da 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 -da. and so i would add that that blip at the end of that um my resume um thankfully because i know a lot of a lot of people go straight from undergraduate to law school um so they don't have much to put on their resume i'm not sh too sure how much my work experience helped um uh, my application package because my work experience is military and signals intelligence that have nothing to do with law i did however do a lot of um legal clerk work while i was in the military so at least i had that and then of course at the end i had the skill bridge program uh compliance system engineer position that i could put up there and that has something to do with like the legal realm so i did that oh, look at me i'm just sweating all my edges out it's hot as hell out here so so i did my i i did my resume i played all my internships um the military luckily they make you volunteer so i had that volunteer work to put on my uh resume as well and then my diversity statement so howard right is known for being a diverse school I mean, it's a HBCU, but it's but it's a HBCU because it gives black people a place, right? But not just for black people, because I'm at orientation. It's not just black people. I've seen a lot of different races, right? So they've heard the story of you know being black and having to deal with that stuff, or even LGBTQ community, because I'm part of that as well. Like I'm pretty diverse as it comes. Uh, Buddhist, black the lgbtq community um invisible disability as it pertains to anxiety ptsd and all of that so i'm like how am i going to make my diversity statement stand out um to an hbcu right my experience has been that of a black female that story has been told i'm sure to them so i was trying to like really think about what actually makes me diverse when it as it doesn't come to like race or anything like that and then i i i wrote about you know i started my statement pretty much like someone could describe me as buddhist lesbian uh black whatever woman but what truly makes me diverse i feel is um my uh level of empathy that i can have for other people um it is ridiculous i feel everything like if i feel like someone's feelings is hurt or i or someone is depressed or stressed i take that on and i feel it myself which is exhausting um but it's helped me to be able to see things from different perspectives right so like me as a black person i can empathize truly empathize with someone from another minority whether it be asian hispanic or anything i could i can empathize and i can sympathize with the struggles and stuff and the obstacles that they have had to go through because of their race or uh transgender or non-binary non-conforming individuals i'm not i'm a cis i identify as a cisgender woman but i can really truly empathize and sympathize with them because i am part of that community as well right so that gives me that gives me a uh, perspective and being able to empathize with other other people being able to understand people so i applied that on how i because of that how i could uh be great in law because i can understand and empathize with other people from different perspectives different religions um braces all of that i can empathize with, with what they are going through so that was my diversity statement that was just a page long so i have my resume my diversity statement and my and my personal statement lsat score and gpa i can't remember exactly how much it costs on lsat but they have that option to do a six report sin so six that's six schools for a, a specific amount of money now thank goodness my my company that i was working for at the time they paid for all of that um 
that's why I was applying to a bunch of schools because I didn't have to, I didn't, the, the application fee wasn't coming out of my pocket. The application fee and the fee for LSAC to send them my package wasn't coming out of my pocket. But you have, you should really, that's, and that's something that they, that they don't warn you or tell you about, but you really have to budget to even take, to take the test or to send this, the application process. Like we talk a lot about, about tuition and how it's going to be expensive, taking out loans, all of that, but they don't tell you that it's expensive before that even gets started. You know, you have the, the, um, those reports, if you have the luxury to pay for study material. A lot of people say that you that uh, paying for study material is not, you don't have to do that. Me being a type A and me being paranoid, I was like, I'm, I'm paying for it. I'm, I'm, I'm getting something, right? Um, not just Googling a, bit, a bunch of different things. I will say on that point too, though, that a lot of people uh, Google and found, found free sources and what works for them. And if it worked for you, it worked for you. But what I did learn it through taking the LSAT is, the LSAT is that you have to have a strategic plan about how you, how you attack problems and about how you analyze uh, what is going on. And if you're getting those tips and tricks from a bunch of different sources, you don't have like a solid ground and a solid plan to attack the the LSAC. Like PowerScore, they have their traditional methods of attacking the test. So that's important, that's important as well. I was not able, I can't remember why, could not get my package in the day that they opened for, open applications. Um, I can't remember, but I got it in the second day. I wanted to be that first group of people because the quicker you get your pa your package in, the quicker you get your decision status back and uh, scholarships. You don't want to wait till the last minute and they don't have any more any more scholarship money left over. So um, that. So by the time that I I sent it in, I I want to say and I'm guessing right now it was around October. It was around October that I sent it in, right? I didn't hear back until two, three, two, three months after that. And sure enough, they sent me an email. And then not long after that, they sent me saying that I got accepted. And I was so excited and I was so happy and I was so proud of myself. And a few weeks after that, they sent my scholarship at, uh, information. I don't know if the amount of the scholarship that I got was based on, you know, me. I'm not sure. I wish I wish there was a way that you get feedback from your application package to see what. But I guess it's like once I got accepted, I got accepted. I ain't really trying to hear nothing else. Or if I got rejected, then I got rejected. I ain't trying to hear why I got rejected on my package. You know, for me, honestly, because my job and growing up in predominantly white institutions, there was a law school, another law school that I wanted to go to, right? Because it's prestigious. Um, the majority of the lawyers that I've knew from my company and that I talked to and I spoke to went to this school, right? And um, I got in to the school. It was my first choice, right? But it was a, a PWI. And I was debating back and forth whether or not Howard or, the, or this school. And I was debating because it's like, I want to be at a HBCU. I want, I'm doing it to help my people, to further my people. I'm going to be a great lawyer someday okay i am i'm going to help those in need um i have a passion for it and when i do i would like my name to be attached to an hbcu you know what i'm saying like it's about represent it's about representation and why would i give my greatness and my money to a predominantly white institution so when you know decades to come when I do help people and I do make a difference in the world my name is always going to be attached to, to them and so it's just going to further their greatness but what about my historically black colleges you know what I'm saying like I'd rather give that time that energy and my money to them to make them greater you know it's about represent representation if if the only schools that are considered to be great are predominantly white institutions, then that is given a misrepresentation to children or to uh, young adults who want to go. You know what I'm saying? You hear a lot about uh, Harvard or Princeton or Yale, right? Predominantly white institutions. And so you have 
young black children growing up say, oh, I aspire to go there. I, was, I aspire to go to Harvard or to Yale, but I want the future of the black community to aspire to go to HBCU. Um, yeah. With that being said, um, my experience thus far with um, administration. Now, as far as orientation and camaraderie, they talk about it a, a lot. It is is like no other. It's amazing. It is amazing. I've just never experienced that before. That before. Um, it's just amazing. And for me, I'm on the older, as far as age, on the older spectrum. I met this girl the other day. She was 19 years old, going to law school. A young black girl. It's amazing. I mean, it's a, and I and I thrive to be into that environment. So I appreciate. I appreciate that. Um, I do. Negatives. Administration. Now, I am coming during the era of COVID. So that's telework. Uh, we talked to a lot of uh, two L's, and a lot of them didn't even know really the campus because they um, did their all their classes online. You know. So this their first year, two L's, and this their first year really been on campus. That's crazy. But like responding to emails very slow calls don't pick up um i don't have it's wednesday classes start on monday i don't know where any of my classes are the schedule that they gave me is missing a class i wouldn't have known that i was missing a class unless i really looked at my schedule because it has me at 11 credits credits as, instead of 16 I'm like, where is the other five credits at? You know what I'm saying? And I had to ask around, ask around. Like, oh, yeah, they're like, they look at my schedule, uh, the mentors or the facilitators, and like, oh, yeah, you're missing such and such class. I'm like, now, if I didn't say nothing or didn't really pay close attention and come next week, I would have just missed a whole class. You see what I'm saying? Like, like little stuff like that. or even using the GI Bill, right? I have been emailing and calling the financial office for months, months. Probably six, seven months ago, I emailed them asking, you know, what is the process for that? They got me in touch with this, uh, with their like VA representative or military representative. Emailed him, he's out of office, okay emailed him when he got out of, uh came back into the office no response emailed again no response emailed the financial office no response nothing for months i literally have not heard from him until yesterday yesterday and i had to send a, a follow-up email again like okay per my last email you know and then he responds and send me the paperwork and the forms to 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 fill out so it's probably gonna take another two, two, three weeks for that to even process. And then even more, uh, even longer for me to receive any funds from that. So I don't want to put it all on the administration because I'm not sure what's going on. It could be COVID, it could be uh, people had to get laid off and so they don't have that those personnel in, anymore who had access to those email accounts or, or phone numbers. Um, I don't know. I don't know, but it's extremely frustrating. And from what I hear and what I gather, that's kind of the theme. Like you just feel like you're just floating out in the ocean and you're just hoping for a line to be put out. Um, I don't like that. I like um, type A, I need to know black and white, what is, what's not, what is it gonna be, what is that gonna be, where I'm gonna be at. Um, I'm one of those people who like to get a lay of the land before you know, I have to go somewhere. And so it was a bit frustrating that I can't do that. And then being on campus, you ask, you know, the students who have been there. And like I said, they don't know because they haven't been there. You know, they don't know. So, um, so of course I had to give you the pros and cons, but um, other than that, I'm excited. I'm kind of just ready to get started. I'm kind of tired of hearing everybody talking about how difficult and how stressed out you're going to be and stuff like that. I'm also glad that I'm at the, 
I'm not gonna say age, but I'm at the point in my life where I don't care about clubbing. I don't care about going out drinking. I'm not a drinker like that. Um, two drinks, I'm done. Um, I'm in bed by eight o'clock, nine o'clock. I'm just not a club person. So that kind of that kinds of that kind of takes away from like oh I'm not gonna have a social life. I'm not gonna be able to go out unless I'm going on a, on a trip somewhere. I or my parents house i don't really i don't have i don't have uh, a want or a need or urgency to go out stuff like that so i'm i'm at a place where i really can focus on just my schoolwork and um it's nice to finally be able to go i'm i'm thankful for their clause that you can't work the first year um because it's nice to be able to just focus on school and not try to focus on work as well. My whole life has been work and school and to be able to just focus on getting an education. If you have any questions or you need any tips as far as the LSAT goes, let me know. I'll help you out with that as well. Thank you for tuning in again. I will see you all next time.